I go to the next uh, speaker, uh, Axel Brandenburg, who will be giving us selected code updates uh, since 2021. So, Axel, please uh, go ahead. Right, thank you. Um, right. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Piali, and the rest of the organizers uh, for being uh, so kind to organize this wonderful meeting this week. We have uh, had extremely positive experience with uh, hybrid and uh, online meetings in the past. In many ways, uh, this has been really a, a great advantage of the pandemic that we all learned to get together <clears throat> in, a, in a way that is otherwise not so closely uh, possible uh, on, on such large numbers. On the other hand, I do appreciate the meetings in person, and uh, I hope we will have that opportunity in upcoming, occasion, upcoming occasions. It is the 18th meeting, and you see here a picture from the pencil code page. The first meeting started uh, in Denmark as a result of resolving um, the problem that we had by having, having two different branches, which uh, diverged over a little more than a year, I think. And so that was a major reason to get together and to do some uh, code changes. But the community uh, has been very useful. Um, it was really useful to be together with other people. And so we had meetings in various different places. Uh, including Leiden, uh, St Stockholm, Leiden, Heidelberg, New York, Toulouse, Helsinki, Lund, Göttingen, Trondheim, Graz, Newcastle, Boulder, Espo, Helsinki, uh, Glasgow, Lausanne, and now in uh, Bangalore. I hope this will continue. We will make sure that it will continue. And so if any of you have any suggestions uh, or proposals for a new uh, meeting, uh, then please uh, let us know. We can communicate over that uh, during any of the coffee breaks, um, and I'm certainly available to discuss. So today I would like to review a few, a few selected uh, code updates since the last user meeting. There were a few which have to do with uh, developments that uh, I myself was involved in, and there is others uh, that will be discussed uh, during this meeting. In particular, uh, the radiation module, uh, Felipe um, Navarrete, uh, who is also currently visiting Norida, has been doing some uh, changes and some and discovered uh, a, a major bug in the four horizontal arrays that was introduced already back in 2006 and was unnoticed. Um, there is uh, the, also the inter interesting interaction with other codes that Matthias will be talking about. So other codes include, uh, for example, the ULAC code that has been used by, uh, by a few people. So uh, then I will be beginning by talking about um, some changes that we have done in connection with primordial magnetogenesis. We uh, had a few additional applications of the Poisson solver. One is in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, the other in the um, calculation of the vector potential in the Coulomb gauge. And then um, next, uh, an item where we can uh, calculate radial distribution functions. This is just as an example of how useful the code can be uh, really just to use its infrastructure and not actually using much of the actual calculations, certainly not doing any kind of MHD or not even solving any PDEs. And as I will explain, not even running the code. You don't even need to run the code in order to use the code. So then I will uh, talk about um, some applications and tests uh, using the uh, calculating the Safman invariant. Um, you know, Hongshe has been doing significant work, also Ramkishore, both, uh, both of them are in the audience. So regarding inflationary magnetogenesis, it is in, in a, a 
based on the time during inflation. Inflation is a time when the universe is uh, exponentially increasing. The densities become lower and lower and lower. So any matter that was present in the universe becomes extremely diluted. Um, and so we don't have any conducting particles and no, therefore no conductivity. And so as a consequence, we just have to solve the Maxwell equations. The Maxwell equation in its usual form uh, can be expressed then as two first order PDEs. Uh, in Fourier space, uh, you replace the curl by uh, IK cross operator and it appears twice. So you have a K squared operator here and the double prime means the double derivative is respect to time. However, it is not the ordinary time, it's called the conformal time. And so conformal time allows us to uh, change the equation. Unfortunately, I didn't write down the definition of conformal time, but here's for example, the scale factor of the universe uh, during a subsequent phase uh, at the end of inflation, which is called uh, reheating. So during the reheating period, the scale factor increases quadratically with conformal time. And so eta here goes from minus one to plus one, and that's the end of the reheating period. During that period, the conductivity is still very small, negligible, and uh, there are additional terms to the induction equation or the Maxwell equation. Both of them have to do with uh, factors that depend on the expansion of the uh, universe. And so here you see this, um, um, expression which goes like uh, one over time essentially and here another one one over time squared so those are the modifications to the maxwell equation that we need to, uh, that we need to be concerned with and so we have applied this method and i will show you in a moment what we did but the essential right yeah so the essential piece i wanted to show actually on this next page which um, is a bit small from the poster that we will be presenting here at Nordida at the uh, in a few hours and so uh, unfortunately that's a bit small but you see here the time a uh, okay i can actually move in um, uh, so you see here the uh, scale factor as a function of time and i use here the scale factor as a measure of time uh, which is uh, somewhat more convenient here so when it's one that's the beginning of the radiation dominated era and so prior to that, we have the late reheating time. And so uh, these extra terms, which uh, the F prime over F and the F double prime over F, they lead to a growth of the magnetic field at very low wave numbers. And so the growth can be al nearly algebraic. Here it's, for example, proportional to A to the ninth power. So it's not an exponential growth as for dynamos, but it's an algebra or a near algebraic growth as you see here for different models. In this approach, we solve the Maxwell equations only during the reheating period, and we actually switch to full MHD uh, only at that moment. Uh, as you see here from the evolution of the magnetic field, uh, that uh, does not lead to any visible change in the RMS magnetic field, although it does constitute a slight discontinuity in terms of uh, first and second derivatives of, of the scale factor. Therefore, you do see a few minor oscillations here, for example, in the subsequently calculated or in the simultaneously calculated uh, gravitational wave energy. So what we are interested in is uh, solving for the magnetic field uh, as we would have it today. It would have been decaying until today, but it would also have produced gravitational waves. And those gravitational waves uh, will be also the subject of this uh, user meeting here today. And it has been also a subject of previous meetings. So this is here the gravitational wave equation. And it actually is very similar in the sense that it's also a wave equation, just like the Maxwell equation. And therefore we have to use an approach which, um, which we have learned from the gravitational wave module is not the usual advance of the, um, with respect to the, so our third order time advance, but we actually make use of the analytic solutions uh, both of this equation and of this equation. And that's what I will show next. Um, I thought, maybe I confused some pages here. Let me just double check here. 
Um, okay. I don't know. Um, I thought I thought maybe I forgot to include. Oh no, it is actually here. No, it's not. Yes, it is because you see. Right. Sorry, I was just confused. Maybe it was not It was in fact the next page. So here you see then how the MIG file looks like. Um, you, those of you who are familiar with this know that, of course, we have a lot of no modules. Uh, so if you don't want to use MPI, message passing interface, you would use no MPI. And, it, and here we don't use any hydrodynamics. And we have to have to say no viscosity and we don't use any density. And we don't use a usual magnetic field, but we do say magnetic is equal to magnetic slash Maxwell. Maxwell. And so that also works now. Uh, that means we, we we are solving the equation in Fourier space. That means we have to include, therefore, the Fourier FFT pack uh, and power spectra are being outputted as diagnostics. And in this case, uh, the gravitation module, the wave module, is used as a special module. And this is with these endings is a default version. T and X mean the plus and cross polarization modes. So these are the two functions of the gravitational waves. But we see here is if we, in the Maxwell equation uh, solver, if inflation is included, then these uh, F double prime and F factors are being included here. Those are here, for example. So here you see the inverse uh, quadratic time dependence. And T now is the conformal time. It's called eta in publications, but it's still called T in the code. Uh, this was actually the uh, the situation that this 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 is the stuff that is being used during uh, for our applications, and so there's a what used to be k squared now becomes a k squared effective, which therefore can become negative. So a negative k squared means, of course, that we can potentially have growth, and that growth occurs because of this beta term here. So now we have a wave equation which is no longer um, one with real. Um, but rather potentially with complex um, K values. And this is because the conductivity, which is now called sigma, which of course people are used to think of one over eta. The conductivity is one over eta when you mean by eta the magnetic diffusivity. But in, um, in the early universe communities, people think of eta not as a magnetic diffusivity, but as the conformal time, as I said earlier. And then of course, um, we shouldn't use eta anymore for the inverse for the diffusivity, and therefore we use sigma, which also makes somewhat sense. And so now, depending on the value of sigma, you can calculate what is the um, you can calculate the full system of uh, equations. There are two eigenvalues, lambda one and lambda two, uh, which you can calculate using algebra, complex algebra, and then you can simply update um, the, the magnetic field in Fourier space, which is called a. K, we have cross of Fourier space, and then there's real part and imaginary parts. Both of them are in the F array. And because these parts of the F array are not being advanced in time in the usual sense, they are both auxiliary arrays. They must therefore be written and read uh, by, the, by the code. So don't forget to put in L right underscore aux uh, if you want to read for restarting your, um, your auxiliary array. So all the time advance, all this analytic solution here is happening just because of, uh, because through these auxiliary arrays. So here's now the actual update. We have the vector potential uh, in complex formulation. This is a real and imaginary part now assembled from the previous uh, time. And there is a, this electric field. I remind you the electric field is a negative curl of A. But it also is because in the vial gauge dA by dt or dA by d theta is a minus sign. So we have two first order equations, one for A and one for E. And then we solve them. And you see here there's a formulation which suggests it's a cosine and a sine term. But in reality, they are really uh, complex functions. They would really turn if, if there was no growth, if it was purely real, uh, then the cosine of A omega t, ot, uh, would really be just the cosine of omega times t, and omega is the modulus of k. But in this case, it's slightly more complex. And then uh, you update the auxiliary array by its real and imaginary parts of what 
used to be here complex. So this is a, one of the important applications that we have done in the last year. There's another application, the post use of the Poisson solver. Uh, the Poisson solver, of course, is used for self-gravity. Uh, and self-gravity is being used not only for the gas, it's also, of course, all the time already used for, the, for particles. Uh, if you turn on the particles, and there was a recent email uh, which Matthias unfortunately uh, fortunately answered, uh, and Matthias just joined the audience. So thanks, Matthias, for uh, explaining this to one of it's one of the questions in pencil dash discuss. Uh, but there is now another possibility: if uh, if L special is true, then it checks whether by any chance uh, there is an array which comes with the name psi underscore real or psi underscore imaginary. So uh, potentially this call can go wrong if somebody makes a special, issue, a special module and that person defines an array which also is called psi underscore real, but it's not what I meant here by that. So what I meant by that is what uh, Anthony Mee has already implemented it back in 2004, namely the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. It's also called the gross pedayevsky equation. It is used for superfluids. And uh, as you, I will say in a moment, I'm not actually solving for super, superfluids, but I'm still solving for this equation. Um, so the, there's another interesting uh, thing I would like to emphasize, and Matthias taught me that. Uh, there is a function called f array underscore index underscore by na underscore name. So if you uh, don't know this index, so we often put indices of uh, all the components of the FRA in the C data file. But if you have special modules, then uh, we would really inflate the C data dot uh, inc or dot F90 mod module uh, with completely incomprehensible new additions that anybody might have may have thought of any at any time, any particular time. We don't actually need that. Uh, what we can do instead is we can use this function and that returns then the index. So if this thing has been allocated, then this index exists. Otherwise it's actually zero. And so if both of them are not zero, then we continue and we say the right-hand side of the Poisson equation is now given by the real part uh, of this function squared plus the imaginary part. So that's the modulus of psi squared. And psi is the wave function or the uh, that is used in the Schrodinger equation. And then we solve the inverse Laplacian. So you may not have uh, know about, known about this and you not have thought about it, but people who are familiar with uh, formulations of uh, uh, what is called ultralight dark matter, they know that the ultralight dark matter is no longer well described by actual particles, but is actually better described by wave equation. And that equation is the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So if you now go to this nonlinear linear Schrodinger equation, which is also called the gross pedayevsky equation, and therefore this PE, by the way, um, or the GE rather, GE means uh, gross pedayevsky equation. And Pilayevsky was at Norita once, and he didn't actually call it the gross pedayevsky equation. He just called it the GP equation because he didn't want to name anything by his name, but he had no choice, but at least to use his uh, initials. And so then if self-gravity is also true, then it's simply added to the potential. So of course, uh, as you know, the Hamiltonian uh, has a kinetic part and has also a potential contribution. And in this case, the potential is not given by any, any quantum mechanical syst uh, systems by ele electron charges and stuff like that, but actually by Newtonian gravity. So not more about this at this point, I will now use uh, talk about a completely different application of the Poisson solver. And that also was uh, happening just recently. And so I was uh, pleased uh, that this Poisson solver, which of course only works in periodic boundary conditions works so well. And so if uh, there's now the possibility in the magnetic module to say if the Coulomb gauge is, L Coulomb is true, then it can actually calculate the uh, gauge transformation potential for the Coulomb gauge. So as explained here, um, uh, we simply use our gauge potential, uh, which is in the vial gauge, and therefore has a non-vanishing divergence. Uh, we transform it to the Coulomb gauge, A prime, by subtracting the gradient of a transformation potential where lambda is a scalar. 
uh, we request or uh, require that the divergence of this is zero and therefore it follows by taking the divergence of this expression that the divergence of this a here is given by the del squared of lambda and so again we use a Poisson solver which is done here so uh, if if um, so the right hand side of the Poisson solver is now given by the divergence of a which is now put earlier in the f array and um, and then we can calculate uh, the uh, the right hand side so then we call the inverse Laplacian and then the inverse Laplacian gives us lambda and that's put into another array and so we need two arrays i lambda and i diff a and so this means that we typically in a calculation like this here we put in uh, two auxiliary contributions and also we have two communicated auxiliaries which are the same ones this uh, i lambda then can be used and ca we can calculate for example the gradient of this quantity and can take calculate the dot product between lambda and the magnetic field uh, which is then used in order to calculate uh, the change of the relative magnetic helicity a b so I see that the time is actually running relatively short here. So I see I need to be fast. The, um, one of the applications uh, was the Safman helicity invariant. In order to do that, there's different ways of doing that. Uh, so, so the Safman helicity invariant is a quantity that is based on the magnetic helicity H, a magnetic helicity density H. Uh, it's called here uh, H. Uh, lowercase h, it's a dot b, and that one is a gauge dependent quantity. It will never go away in principle. Um, however, uh, uh, they argue, and by they I mean Hosking and uh, Shekhar Shihin, that the uh, that h times h at different positions, calculated as a correlation function, does actually become gauge invariant. So there's different ways of calculating this. One of the methods is to calculate it as a volume integral over a smaller volume over any smaller sub volume sub v um, and then look at this scaling of uh, which is also plotted here of this hv squared versus the volume so you to consider different volumes this becomes potentially a really horrendous calculation but uh, we have used a trick in the pencil code and that's another interesting thing if you write l right underscore sub uh, 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 underscore f sum is equal to true. What happens then is that each processor data slash proc zero one two writes out a file in uh, which is called f sum f sum dot dot. So this is a data file. Here it's very short. Of course, this becomes a long data file. The, uh, the first in, in a number is the time. All the other numbers are whatever anybody has out requested in the print dot in file. So whatever you are printing out is also being printed out uh, for locally for each processor. And so you get all the information that you needed in order to, in order to uh, obtain different averages. So then there's another ideal routine which we use to uh, assemble all this data and we will not go into such details here. Um, I said earlier, we can use the code even without running it. What is meant by that is that we have as an initial condition, so you really just uh, say uh, start, you only run start, but you only you don't actually run run. <laughs> That's why we run the code without running it. So what we do then is uh, there's a particularly special situation where we have as an initial condition called read a particular data cube. So that's a 512 data cube that fits into each processor still. So we read that in, uh, it's of course, it really only works for 512. That's why it's called like this. And we only used it for that. Um, and then we can calculate the, what is known as a radial distribution function. So given that the time is short, I will not go into details. Uh, you see that in this module, which is called radial distribution function. And it's used uh, in a recent paper with Niels Haugen. So uh, I come back to all these meetings and you see here that on each of these meeting items, there's a thing called agenda. What that actually is, it's uh, checked in, uh, in in the in the in the sub Git version of the www um, version of the pencil code, and uh, I usually put in particular items uh, that are that I'm interested in. But anybody else can also make additions here, and so here are a few such additions: Paraview, visualization, one of them, up, 
winning details. I have actually some new results on that and a few other things. So as we go along, I will uh, run through that checklist occasionally and see whether we made any progress. This, by the way, has not been updated. It was used for Lausanne, but uh, many of the items have actually been updated. So it's actually different from the Lausanne version. So I think uh, that's all here. So this is the 18th meeting. Uh, thanks, Piali, for organizing this uh, wonderful meeting. Thanks also to all the collaborators. Um, I very much enjoy working and doing developing um, the code. It's always a great fun. And it was a great decision in hindsight to make this code immediately public. So thanks to all of you and Piali and collaborators in particular. Thank you, Axel, for giving us this four updates. Uh, so we have time for questions, comments. So if you, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand, and then I can allow you to. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, also, there is the Slack channel, so you can put your questions there. Uh, yeah, I don't see anybody raising their hands right now. Uh, okay, one is there. Uh, Jennifer has a question. Let me just unmute. Yes, thanks a lot, Axel, for this talk. Uh, I had a question on the inflation magnetogenesis part. You show this plot where you um, show the magnetic field evolution for three different um, scenarios, and the RMS magnetic field was comparable for all of them, but then the gravitational wave signal was very different. And I was wondering where this comes from. You're Is talking about this plot here? Yes, exactly. Uh, the gravitational wave uh, signal was very different uh, between the different scenarios, you mean? Or what? Yes, yes. So is it related all, to the um, spectra or? Um, in which sense is it actually different? So you mean the amplitude is different, yes. right? Yes. Yeah, yes, the amplitude is different. Uh, magnetogenesis scenarios are much more effective in producing significant amount of energy. The chiral magnetic effect, uh, CME it's called, uh, is not very efficient. That's because the chiral magnetic effect works mostly at uh, large wave numbers, which is small length scales. And the efficiency of gravitational wave production is uh, inversely proportional to the square of the wave number. And therefore, uh, gravitational wave generation from primordial magnetosynthesis is much more efficient. Mm -hmm. So there was uh, no really... mean field dynamo, uh, mean field chiral dynamo in this. I don't, yeah, that's right. Uh, but I also don't think that would make any difference. But we, uh, and you should, of course, address it. You are the expert on the mean field dynamo part for the current magnetic effect. Thanks. Okay, any more questions? We can still, we have time. <clears throat> there are no more questions. Oh, oh I see, okay. Uh -huh. Anybody in your room, right? Ah, there's maybe some questions. No, no, no. Some Slack questions. These are Slack questions. I don't have my Slack open at the moment. Is there a Slack question? No, not no maybe not. Okay. So okay. I'm happy to address any other questions as we come along. Um, one of the things I mentioned at the very end is um, uh, is this thing about the Yes, um, maybe what was that? Uh, the thing about the, um, one of the items called the, uh, now what did I mean? Uh, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, about hyper, uh, hyper diffusion. Yeah, upwinding, here it is actually, upwinding details. So I, um, if I had uh, one or two more minutes before the before sure, sure. I started my talk, I would have had, no, uh, oh, you want to see it now? I see. <laughs> right, I can do that, of course. Um, uh, what I, what I, I, what is the end of, I thought my time was up at quarter two. No, it's up to it's not, you, you still have some 10 minutes time, so you can. I see. So what I've done is um, uh, upwinding. Um, uh, so actually, we, I was almost thinking of making it as an exercise. Um, upwinding is, so I've done recent, so you know, many of you know what upwinding is. Um, I don't give the details here. 
Uh, but what I found in decaying turbulence simulation is that if you don't use upwinding, the maximum permissible Reynolds number is much smaller. And therefore, when I used upwinding, I was able, especially for decaying MHD turbulence, to use much, um, by much, I mean 10 times higher magnetic Reynolds numbers. And so I was thinking, wow, I overlooked something. And now I have here a comparison between two different files. And, and, I, and I was, of course, not quite ready with everything. And so, and so here's the result. Uh -huh. So what do you think? <laughs> so what you see here is uh, recent was out of the name, let me achieve it. So do, does anybody remember which one was which? And if you don't, then it's even better. So you clearly see that the lower plot has a bigger, bigger, so what is shown here is it's an advection test. I can show you that test also in a moment. Uh, yeah. The dotted line is the is the original magnetic uh, uh, original passive scalar, and okay. the solid line is the one after five revolutions. And you see clearly that there's a bit little bit more of a wiggle of, uh, than in this one. So which one is which? Any any comments? Somebody may have of course noticed this because uh, you saw what I was coding here. I unfortunately forgot it myself. Um, and so the answer is um, oh. with upwinding, with upwinding, it actually becomes worse, as you see. So you do generate, um, you, you make the code more stable, but you also produce an extra artificial wiggle, which is not the real thing. To show you then what really happens is, uh, it is actually an, an example from the advection test. So everybody can do the advection test. You see that on my homepage. If you go to the homepage, uh, there is, um, there is, so if you go to my homepage here, you can see, let me go back to this place here. You see there's these different uh, items and one of them is experiments. And so when you go to experiments, you see various um, tutorials that I was, have been running in the past. And of course, Sharonia has been participating in, and some others have been participating in the Trieste one. And in the Trieste one, we had uh, various items as exercises. And one of them is the advection test. And the material for this, you can download here. And you see, for example, um, what is actually done in this case. So here, for example, you see that it uses a kinematic hydrodynamics module and it uses a passive scalar. By the way, this one, as checked in uses actually the tenth order derivatives. So if you want to do experiments between tenth order derivatives and the and even a, a squared one, I mean a quadratic derivative, which is of course much worse, uh, you can just do this. Everything is prepared for you. And so these are all extremely interesting exercises. But one of the exercises that I was interested in, I now did already for you. And so here's the result. If you um, of this test, so you run the uh, so you would say run start. Ah, let me. No, sorry. Um, uh, you you say start here, and let's have a look at what start is doing. It uses a hat wave with a certain width, and if uh, if the width if the width was very small, you have a so what is known as a startup error. So you cannot use an initial condition with a discontinuity. Uh, but if you if you do that, you will actually immediately some see some wiggles. Um, that of course was all, was all explained in some other situations, and I'm happy to explain that when there is more time. Uh, let me then show in this module the run.in file, and so here we are running for a time which is ten times pi, and that corresponds to five revolution. Uh, that means five times two pi is the time. Uh, that's the end time, t max. And we use this uh, constant flow in the x direction. And we use here diffusivity of 10 to the minus 4. And upwinding for the pass scalar is now, in this case, true. And OK, so now you say start. You say run. And you look at the result. And you can do this also in Python. So here's the thing. And so now you see. There's a small wiggle, and you see that it now goes through the window five times altogether. I see that the um, transmission is a bit choppy here. I see that myself even because I can view it. And then at the very end, you see the 
a space-time diagram of this whole thing. So you can then ch change everything and experiment with this. Remember, I told you something about startup errors. If you don't believe that, you can just do it yourself. You just make the width uh, 10 times smaller. Um, that means the initial condition is sharper. And then, sorry, um, and then you run this test again for five revolutions, that's like this. Simulation time exceeded, uh, that's this. And before I overwrite something, let me uh, let me modify my script here. As I... Okay, um, so then we do the pivot and you will see that it has much worse wiggles here. Uh, I, unfortunately, there's always this delay between my computer and somebody else, something else. You see here uh, that the signal is, it was initially at early times uh, much more choppy. So if I now compare the uh, final and the end field, you see that the initial field, um, after a very short time, already has this vigor and is also much very, very sharp. And uh, much of this goes away because of diffusion but <clears throat> not everything. So that's uh, not actually that good. So that was what I wanted to show about this advection test. So interestingly, and we, we know that of course, uh, using upwinding corresponds to adding a very small amount of hyperdiffusion. And hyperdiffusion <clears throat> is not the regular diffusion operator. It does produce uh, always vigors, as I was already demonstrating at an earlier pencil code user meeting. So are there any new questions? Axel? Yes. So you mentioned yes. that with the upwinding turn on, you could do much higher realness number for, uh, for uh, turbulence simulations. Yes. Yes. How much higher are you talking about here? Uh, 10 times. So I was able to, this hyper, this is upwinding, and especially upwinding in the density, I was able to make the Reynolds number, or at least the diffusivity, 10 times smaller. And the Reynolds number is actually even more than 10 times uh, larger because, uh, because the velocities then became higher and the fields became higher. So obviously we are doing something then, uh, we are making something possible by smoothing this and also introducing these artificial vigors. It prevents the code from crashing. Um, it may not lead to major damage to the physical result, but it, is, it, it certainly one must be always concerned about that. Hyper is, uh, in principle, a very dangerous uh, it's, thing. It's, very, it's actually kind of surprising to me that it, the difference mm -hmm. is so large. I, I wonder, I mean, we, we do introduce some uh, more numerical diffusion through this uh, upwinding, right? So the, the real Reynolds number is probably not that much larger. Do you have any feeling about that? How important is the... Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, the real Reynolds number. Uh, so what, what, what I think would be interesting to do is maybe to do, uh, yeah, right. Uh, so to define a, uh, if you go back here, uh, I go back, uh, to, to calculate what is called the effective wave number. So here we have uh, a way of calculating effective wave numbers. We do this uh, by a trick, by calculating what is called the magnetic helicity, uh, and then uh, that actually becomes the effective wave number. That's because uh, for a helical magnetic field, A dot B is the same as uh, K times A squared. As was, uh, so B is, is uh, for a fully helical field, K times A. So this is, allows us to calculate the effective wave number. So you change the actual wave number, uh, which is shown down here, and you calculate what is, uh, whether the effective wave number is actually uh, equal to the input wave number. That means we should be on the diagonal, which is the theory. So for our six order scheme, uh, this of course declines. This is one of the exercises. Uh, this same experiment could be done uh, with a trick now also for the for this case. So then we would know something a little bit more. Uh, but answering your question about an effective difficulty, yeah. So I'm, uh, I should, if there's still time for that, I should uh, remind people what it actually means. And uh, that goes back to an appendix uh, of a paper with Wolfgang Dobler uh, of the year 2006.
Um, I think it was in the beginning of the year, but here it is. So if you click on that paper and you go to the appendix, appendix is near the end, so I put here page 11, then you see uh, that using upwind schemes, uh, which means an upwind version of, a, of the advection operator, u dot grad log rho or grad s, then it does actually correspond uh, to using a centered different scheme. So an upwinded scheme is not a centered one, it's an off-centered one, where there is one uh, stencil less in the downstream direction. And once that means we have you still six stencils in the upwind direction, but only two in the downwind direction. Uh, and it does correspond to adding uh, the sixth derivative, which is uh, for a hyper diffusive term, uh, multiplied by delta x to the fifth power. So it goes, becomes very, very small if the mesh becomes finer. And there's a coefficient alpha in front of them, which is one over 60 for one direction. And for each direction, there's a new contribution and therefore can be three times more. So there is uh, an exactly calculable amount of hyperdiffusion, which is proportional to delta x to the fifth power and the modulus of the velocity. Yes, does this answer your question? Yeah, kind of. So we wouldn't have to put this in somehow in order to calculate what a Reynolds number would actually be then. Mm, yes, I think the best way would be to actually do it with a turbulence application and then could calculate a decaying turbulence and compare the two different spectra mm, in, yeah, in comparable more... situations and yeah. see how much, um, maybe not even decaying, but force turbulence because then we have stationary conditions. So that's something for the weekend to do. And then we can compare on Monday again. <laughs> Yeah, I think, yeah, I think comparing uh, stationary turbulence would actually be really interesting. In, in yes. But... All right. Let's do that. Great. Mm. Any okay. other Thank comments? You. Thank we you. Have 43 actually. people here. Two people already dropped out. Anybody else? Great to see so many people here. Anyway, if anybody has any questions or comments, I'm Axel. Just uh, contact me. I'm always happy to talk. Yeah.